BT crops, for example, where we have a clear target uh, organisms like uh, the European corn borer or the Western corn rootworm, and then we are concerned about potential adverse effects or harmful effects on other arthropods in our agricultural system that we value. And this, uh, among those, uh, you have pollinators like the honeybee that uh, visits maize plants to collect pollen. You have predators and parasitoids that help you to control insect pests in your systems, and you have protected species, species of cultural value like these uh, nice butterflies. Now, I've been asked to, uh, to talk about unintended effects uh, and how they are addressed in this non-target risk assessment, and I'm not aware of any, let's say, serious report in the literature or a real case report where unintended effects that are due to the transformation or the way how you have produced your insect desirable plant, for example, have caused adverse effects on natural enemies. Um, but what I found intriguing is, despite that fact, uh, certain new restrictions are starting to ask for tests to analyze those unintended effects. I don't know why they do that, but they do it, and I think this will rather confuse our risk assessments and not help us. And that's what I would like to, to show you in, in this presentation. Now, a very short recap on environmental risk assessment, and you know that builds on Alan Raybould's talks uh, and, and Alan Gray's talks. Um, I think what we do start with in the environmental risk assessment is this important problem formulation stage where we formulate plausible risk hypotheses, and subsequently we test those hypotheses. That can be done with data or knowledge that we already have, but it might also require us to do additional tests. Uh, these tests should be done in a very thorough way, so we, we want to have high-quality data um, that address these hypotheses. Very important is that any study that we do should decrease the level of uncertainty. If we are not certain that these data help us, we shouldn't collect those data, and that requires that the risk assessors, the ones that have to look at the data and the ones that generate the data, agree how they can be used. We have also heard about the comparative approach, so this is, is, is one important element of the environmental risk assessment where we simply compare the GM plant to the non-GM comparator to figure out what is the difference. And if we find a difference, is this difference of any relevance? And it's obvious if you have a BT plant, one obvious difference is the BT toxin, so the intended change. So that's something that comes out very clearly. But you will also use data from the molecular characterization, the compositional, agronomic, phenotypic uh, characterization to, to look, is there anything else that we, we, we might be, have to, to worry about? That eventually we come up with two potential sources of risk. So we have a BT maze, and there are two ways <coughs> in theory, how this BT maze could harm our non-target organism. One thing is clearly something that we can anticipate. It. The intended change that we have made, which makes the plan to produce a BT toxin, might have unintended effects on non-target species. So this comes out very clearly, and that's easy. We know how to deal with that, and I will show you in a minute how we do that. The other thing is these unintended changes that might happen, they are unanticipated, but they can also have unintended effects on NTOs. And, and that's where the comparative approach comes into, into play. We have to know if we know those effects, and if they are of some very, we can also assess those. But until now, as, as by today, this has never been the case. So all the risk assessments on BT crops, for example, have uh, focused on this uh, risk uh, source up here. And for this, potential risk source, it's relatively easy, again, to formulate risk hypotheses. And a typical hypothesis that we address in the risk assessment reads like the expressed protein, the BT protein, is not toxic to non-target arthropods present uh, at the concentrations as it is present in the field. And this hypothesis is then typically tested in a so-called tiered risk assessment framework where we typically start with laboratory uh, studies which are very powerful in assessing uh, the toxicity of this compound. So this is an indicator for harm, and only if we cannot rule out a risk at this level uh, do we continue with additional, more complex, more realistic, but also much more expensive and time-consuming tests on the semi-field or eventually uh, field environments. Now, just a word on these laboratory non-target studies, because that's where I spend most of my time uh, on, 
they provide a very powerful test of the risk hypothesis that I just read to you on the, on the last slide because of these five major uh, reasons. First of all, we can, select, uh, we can select test species that from which we know that they are relevant, representative of the species that are out in our fields in the receiving environments and from which we know that they are most likely to be exposed to this particular stressor to this toxin. We can also make use of what we know about the toxin to select species that are most likely to be sensitive. So it's like, uh, as, uh, as Alan said, looking for the black swan. So if you have a BT maze that, con that produces a Cry3 toxin to kill beetle pests, it's more likely that predatory beetles are adversely affected than a honeybee, for example. So you can make use of this knowledge. And last but not least, you can select species that you have available in large quantities and also quality and where you have validated test protocols. You know what you are testing in your laboratory assay. So you have a pure, typically you have a purified Bt toxin, it's well characterized, you know the purity, you know its bioactivity, you mix it into an artificial diet, for example, in an ideal world, feed it to your non-target species, and you can provide worst case exposure conditions. So you can test doses of this toxin that are uh, a 10, 100 times or more higher than what these insects would be exposed to in the field. Very important because it adds a safety margin to your assessment. Next important point, the data interpretation is relatively easy because you only look at your stressor. So every effect in a, in a good lab assay, every effect that you see in your lab assay can be linked back to this stressor and nothing else. And you have negative and positive control treatments included that help you to interpret those data. And since uh, we work in the lab and like this Petri dish uh, systems, we can do a high number of replications which adds statistical power. So overall, if we do a study properly and, and there are certain design criteria that you have to consider, including those, and you don't see an effect, you have a very high confidence that this toxin is not toxic to this particular non-target organism. So how does that look for these unintended, unanticipated effects? And I, just as an example, I would like to refer to the EFSA guidance from, from 2010, because this is one year restriction I'm pretty familiar with, but also they request you to do studies on those non-target, on these unanticipated, uh, unintended non-target effects. So they also consider data from the molecular compositional uh, acronomic characterization, but they also ask for GM planned NTO interactions, and they can come from the field, but they also ask for something that they call tier 1B studies. So the lab studies that I explained to you on the last slide, they would be considered tier 1A studies using purified toxin. Now tier 1B studies, they request in addition to those, and they want you to use GM plant material. The reasoning that's given in the guidance is that the compositional analysis that's done up here does not necessarily target specific metabolites known to be involved in NTO plant interactions. Now, how do we translate that into a risk hypothesis? And one that I could come up with is that the transformation has not caused changes in specific metabolites known to be involved in NTO plant relationships. So basically just taking up what EFSA proposes. Now I, as, a, as somebody who has to do those tests, I have major problems with that because we usually do not know which metabolites are involved in those plant insect interactions. And even worse, so we, we have a few examples where we know quite a bit. But from what we know, we can also uh, expect that different metabolites are very likely to affect different non-target species in very different ways. So how, how, how do we go about with this uh, risk hypothesis? Now, you want to do a tier 1B study, according to EFSA, using plant material. And that comes with a lot of challenges. Because, you know, what, how do you choose your test material? How do you characterize your test material? Um, where do you produce your material? Do you do biotritrophic tests? I will show you an example. You can have a, a predator like a ladybird beetle. You can feed it with pollen. So you, this would be called a bitrophic test. So you feed it with plant material. But you can also feed it with a herbivore, another arthropod that was feeding on the plant. So that's a, what we would call a tritrophic test. Which species are you actually testing? And how, how, how difficult or how easy is it to interpret those data? <coughs> 
Now, in terms of the comparator to your GM line, what EFSA proposes is to use the near isogenic non-GM material. So you will find this all over the guidance. Sounds great, but it's not so not not so simple because uh, we know I, I don't have really hard data, but we know that the near isogenic line differs in more than the transgene from the uh, from the from the GM line. And, and I have seen numbers in the literature that go up to 10% difference in the genome. So you're not just testing the impact of the transgene or, or the trait that you have introduced. You test something else. So there is a planned background that messes up with your, with your testing. In many cases, near-isogenic lines may not be available. And we have heard that in Europe we have to analyze and do these type of studies also with stack traits. You, for a stack that is, has been produced by conventional breeding, you don't have a you don't have a comparator like that comes close to a near isogenic line. So that my worry is, if you work with this plant material, it's very likely that effects that you're going to see on your non-target species might be due to something, and has nothing to do either with the with the toxin that you included or with the transformation process. It could be anything, and you can't separate that. Secondly, something that we very typically observe, you know, this is the data, I'm sorry for the, for the lousy quality, but I, that's the quality of the PDF that I had. What we typically see, this is from a, from a field study, you, you compare a BT plant, it's near isoline and two conventional varieties. And what people did here over three years, they measured the abundance, that means the number of this mirrored, it's a herbivore that feeds on maize in Europe, um, and, and looked whether there is a BT effect or not, or an effect of the BT maze. Now, in their system, they didn't see a, a difference between the BT and the non-BT plant. However, you see there is a up to five or even six-fold difference in abundance of this herbivore on these two conventional varieties. Now, we need those as a, as a sort of a baseline. Now, how do, you, how do you select those baseline and how do you compare this with, with your BT, non-BT pair? And this is something, uh, because in many of those assessments, you might see small differences here, which might be significant. And then it, the, the, the interpretation of your data totally depends on how you select these comparator lines. So if you could, like in this case, choose two comparator varieties that are very distinct from each other, but you could also choose two which are very close to each other, and all of a sudden your BT maze effect becomes relevant. So, so, so what, what I'm saying is that you know, uh, it will all depend on basically which type of varieties you were using by chance to put your BT, non-BT effects into context. And what I'm also worried about is that if you go in the field, you know, this is a certain event, but this is also a certain variety of GM maze. So maybe the data look very different if you take another variety of the same event. Last but not least, the data that I tried to, to find in the literature, which is difficult, so I used some of our unpublished results, is where is the material produced? Uh, makes a big difference on the quality of your material as you feed it to insects. And this is just an example where we were characterizing pollen from maize, because that's eaten by a lot of uh, arthropods, non-target species, and we analyzed its nitrogen and protein content. And if you just look at the white and the black bars, these are samples from uh, maize grown in a semi-field environment or in a glasshouse at the same time at our research station. There was a significant difference uh, in, in both those factors, depending on where the plants were grown. And if you compare, for example, this BT minus line up here, and if you compare it to a, a field sample of the same line, you know, I, I wonder to what extent this material, if I would use this in a, in a non-target test to look for unintended effects, would actually be a proxy for, for what we would have out in the field, because this, this material is quite different. And again, we, we don't have any base, baseline for these type of comparisons. We don't know uh, a, across the maize gene pool, all the varieties that are commercialized in Europe, we don't know the range of the nitrogen or protein content in the different varieties. So again, it all depends on what, what just by chance you are testing here in parallel. Now, a plant consists of a lot of different uh, parts. So you have a root, you have a stem, you have leaves, you have pollen, silk in the kernels, whatsoever. 
what am I going to test? Now EFSA tells us what you do should reflect realistic exposure conditions. Sounds great, but what is that? What is a realistic exposure condition? This is an example from our study where we were interested to see whether this adult beetle, it's a diaprotica, a corn rootworm beetle, is actually sensitive to the CRY3 toxin that is expressed in Bt maze. Now, we were interested in, in looking at, at the impact of the plan on the beetle, so that's all that's important now. So what is this beetle feeding in the field on? It feeds on pollen, it feeds on silk, but since this is not always available, it also feeds on leaves. So what is the realistic exposure scenario? I, I don't know, so that's why we tested everything. Now what you can see, if you just look at this uh, right graph, which is the fecundity, so this is the number of eggs that these females that were eating these different materials uh, were producing, you can see that there's a huge difference between females that fed pollen versus silk versus leaves. But what is much more important in this context is we see a significant difference for the silk, but not for the other two. So, you know, what do I do with this data? I mean, we, we couldn't even make sense out of this data uh, in, in respect to our question that was, you know, is this beetle sensitive to the toxin? But, you know, if that would have been a test for unintended effects, you know, if I test the leaves, I'm fine. If I test the pollen, I'm fine. If I test the silk, uh, bad luck, you know? So the outcome of your test might differ with the material that you are using. And last but not least, the example here from a predator, what I, this is a predatory mite, a very minute insect, uh, arthropod, I have to say, which feeds on two major food sources. One is spider mites, that's why we use it in biological control. The other thing is pollen. So now here we were again interested in seeing whether the Bt maze has an adverse effect on this predatory mite. Now if you see here, we looked for female development time, so how long do they need to be mature, and how many eggs do they lay, and we found no significant difference between the BT and the non-BT treatment. Now when we repeated, or we, in parallel, we also tested BT and non-BT maize pollen, and all of a sudden we see a significant effect. We see a significant delay in development, which is not a good thing, and we see a significant decline in fecundity, again, not a very good thing. Now, as I said, we were interested in finding out whether this species is sensitive to the toxin. So we also did ELISA analysis and we saw that there is a lot of toxin and we know it's biologically active in the spider mites but there's very very little in the pollen. So we could make some sense out of that, the, these data because it allows us to conclude that whatever happens here it's probably not due to the Bt toxin but something else. But if you care about unintended effects, you know, which of those two is the relevant route of exposure? I, I, I don't know. That's why we tested both. What, what do I do with this data if I'm concerned about unintended effects? I don't know. And, and the point is, bi and tritrophic experiment might give you very different results. <coughs> Last but not least, I, I showed you at the beginning that you know, the test species that we are actually using for our risk assessment studies should be very carefully selected. And uh, in, in, a, in a working group, we, we, we propose three major criteria on how you could do that. First of all, you should look for sp test species that are relevant, and that means they represent value taxa or functional groups that are most likely to be exposed to the stressor. So that if the stressor is our Bt toxin, this is relatively easy. So we can use this criteria to address this first risk hypothesis. Potential sensitivity, if we know what our stressor is, if we know its mode of action, its spectrum of activity, again, we can use this to select the species that are most likely to be sensitive. Again, helps us to address this hypothesis. And last but not least, the availability and the, uh, of the test material, but also of validated test protocols, we can make use of that. Now, if we think about this second hypothesis regarding these unintended effects, which we haven't characterized, so we don't know exactly what it is, we basically rely largely on this third criteria. So test what you can test. And I don't find that extremely, uh, I mean, very, I, I don't feel very comfortable and together with all the other concerns that I showed you before, that you don't know which variety of plant you are testing, 
that you don't know which plant material, which part of the plant you're testing, I'm, I'm pretty concerned whether these studies uh, do us any, any good and add any certainty to the assessment. So in conclusion, I would say that you should avoid testing for unanticipated, unintended effects as long as the stressor is not known. If your compositional analysis or something shows you there is a serious concern with something, uh, do it, because then you know which stressor you are talking about, and you can characterize this stressor. But if you look just for something uh, which is not very well defined, I would rather not do it. Because it will be very difficult to separate plant crowd, uh, I mean, to make, I mean, to interpret your data and to, to see, you know, is, are those differences that you are seeing due to really an unintended effect or due to any su something else. A big Drawback is that we don't have baseline data. If you feed a, a ladybird beetle or the, the predatory mites with maize pollen, we don't have data on how these uh, species uh, do and live on a range of different maize pollens from a range of different varieties. So we are lacking baseline data that you have available for the compositional analysis. So all this data is not there. Um, my worry is that as soon as you uh, base your risk assessment on those plant tissues, you are in danger of moving from an event-specific regulation to a variety-specific regulation. And I can tell you from discussions that we had in Europe that there are actually scientists that are in favor of these plant tests. If you, if you challenge them at discussions, they say yes for the time being because of all the uncertainty that we are having. I want to see tests on every single GM variety. And think about the hundreds that we are having. And in Europe, we are not even able to regulate an event. So, you know, think about all the varieties. And the, the, the other concern is that whatever data you generate, they are very specific to this particular plant and to this particular organism. So these data are not portable or transportable and of no use, I would say, to any other risk assessment. If you do a toxicity assay and you, can, you get a result that, for example, a, a cry one toxin is not toxic to a ladybird beetle, this data is a generic piece of information that can be adopted or applied in China when they put the same gene or the same toxin into a rice plant. You know? So this is a generic piece of information. But if you feed a BT maize pollen from a certain variety, European variety, to a European ladybird beetle, this data is not transportable. So I think my worry is with these studies that we confuse the risk assessment rather than adding certainty. The point is what I forgot to mention, that again, we have no information on what effect is then regarded by the risk assessors as relevant. So if you look into the EFSA guidance document, it is the only thing that they are concerned about is the statistically significant differences. And with, with in these type of test systems, I can always choose material to ensure that you will get a significant difference. And I think, you know, that's why I believe that those tests will add confusion. And I think the only way out of this is that we should stick to the way that we have doing things in the past, that we should characterize our crops to see whether there are differences that are potentially varying. So we have to know those stresses of concern uh, to develop those plausible risk hypotheses and to do meaningful testing. Thank you.